welcome, welcome. It's really nice to see a lot of you. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. Sorry, not a lot of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this, uh, you're here for the second Zero Knowledge Summit. Um, this has been a pretty exciting road getting to this part, at, to this point. There's a lot of people who applied to be here. I've had to say no to a lot of people. You are the lucky few. Welcome. <laughs> so, um, I'm Anna. I'm Frederick. And uh, we're the co-hosts of a podcast called Zero Knowledge. Oh. Wi-Fi info first. Oh, oh, oh. Zero Knowledge. So yeah, the Zero Knowledge podcast, I think some of you might know about it. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit more about it as we go on. To start, though, I'm going to share just some practical info. Why is this? Oh, maybe there. it's, yeah, it's bottom, bottom. That's this way. So practical info. Uh, first piece of practical info is I really like this color scheme. It's extremely bright. I don't know why, but this is where we're going with it. I hope you don't mind. It might make your eyes burn just a little bit. <laughs> All right. So Wi-Fi. Uh, there are signs around the room to get hooked up to the Wi-Fi. Please do that. There is a Telegram group, which you should have received an invite to. Try to get into it. Oh, wait. What? What did you need? This guy? Sure, sure. So yeah, the Telegram group. Um, I... I saw a few people started to, like a few of the people who are hosting breakouts started to sort of post notes about their breakouts. That's great. Do that. Like, if you're hosting a breakout, use this group to just let people know what you're doing. I think it would be really cool. Yeah, amenities. There's coffee all day. There's going to be some lunch. There's going to be some drinks later. Um, everything should be taken care of. I think if you try to buy booze during the day, you have to pay for it yourself. Sorry, <laughs> we're not supporting day drinking here. Uh, but everything else should be covered. Cool. Talking a little bit about the program, our layout is slightly different from uh, last year. So we do have two stages, three breakout sessions. If you were here last year, the rooms have shifted around a little bit, so just pay attention to that. The second stage is at the back of that hallway over there. and. Uh, we have a packed schedule. There's a lot of exciting things to talk about, so uh, there's a lot of stuff going on kind of at the same time. Uh, these posters will be up everywhere, so if you can't read this right now, which you probably can't, that's totally fine. Just find the poster with the schedule outside, or it's also available online. This is the afternoon, and we can get back to that later. Um, just a quick note. I think you guys might have noticed when you came in, There's some. we gave you stickers if you don't want to be on camera. But just so you know, this room and the other, uh, the side chain stage, so that's a stage, those will both be filmed. So just maybe keep that in mind. Cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about the podcast. For those who don't know, or maybe those who are curious about like what we've been up to, um, we started this podcast in, actually, do you want to say this part? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah, we started early, or sort of uh, 2017, but early 2018, we decided to try to make this a weekly thing and just go for it. And it turned out that we could, and it, it, it kind of worked. Uh, so now it's a weekly podcast. We did the event, the first event in March, and it was a huge success, so we're obviously doing it again. We've done, in the meantime, a bunch of podcasts, um, especially like some event-focused ones as well, that uh, sort of if you're interested in events, you can check out. Um, but in general, we have 41 episodes out and counting, so we have over, I think, 37 hours of what I believe is great educational content. And... Um, on all sorts of topics. If you haven't listened to the podcasts, uh, these are some of our most popular episodes. Uh, so, intro with Howard Du, who's right here, to ZK Snarks. Uh, and Fastest it, uh, growing podcast a, a so far. General introduction to Zero Knowledge Proofs, that's sort of uh, at a bit lower level, that you might send to someone who doesn't know what it is already. Um, we have a great story by Griff of what happened around the DAO, and more. Cool. So I think we wanted to quickly give you guys just a sense of like why we're doing the Zero Knowledge Podcast. Um, I think, so the Zero Knowledge Podcast, the topics that we cover are not only Zero Knowledge, we're actually doing the Zero Knowledge series right now, but we also cover sort of general decentralized 
web topics, web three topics. We interview people we think are really interesting. Um, Personally, what's been really cool about this event is, or about this podcast is whenever I've been curious about something, I get a chance to dive into it, to interview somebody and sit with them maybe like an hour, ask them everything I want and then share that. And I think what I've seen the podcast kind of evolve into is something where we can add like a bit of context to a lot of these projects and a lot of the other, even like educational platforms where they're trying to teach you about things. We're not necessarily only teaching, we're trying to like add the little extra, the, the feel for what it's like to work in it. And as somebody who comes from the startup land and has shifted over to de like more decentralized web topics, um, I feel like it appeals to devs like that, people or people who are, you know, maybe coming from tech, but not this exact kind of tech. What about you? For me, it's always been, I started the podcast because I wanted to have something that I would listen to. Uh, I basically couldn't find the content that I wanted, and so I went out to try to make it. And I mean, I'm a developer. I'm trying to approach this from a developer's point of view, uh, talk about things that I'm interested in that I think a developer would be interested in. So um, hopefully, a lot of people in this room would find that interesting as well. So what's next for us? Uh, we're going to keep going. We're going to build out more community things, the Telegram group, Twitter. We actually started our Twitter uh, here last time at the Zero Knowledge Summit 1, so it's grown pretty nicely since then. And um, we're also looking to find more partners and sponsors to help us grow. And so far, we've actually done very few sponsorships on our podcast, and I think that was like a kind of a smart move to like understand our voice. But yeah, we're, we're definitely more open to that now. And we want to do um, some more events, like this one. So what is, do you want to say this part or do I say this part? I don't remember. I'll keep going. Okay. Uh, what is this? This is the second edition of the Zero Knowledge Summit. There's 150 participants, I would say. This time, I think it's going to be like maybe a little bit more. The topics we chose to do this time was uh, zero knowledge, ZK snarks, and privacy. Uh, last time was a bit more general. This time we actually focused in much more on, on zero knowledge topics. You are currently in House Ungan. This is, it has a little history that's kind of neat. Uh, it was, I mean, so the building is not very pretty from the outside. I think we can all acknowledge that. Uh, but the view is really nice. And it actually, so it used to be the Hungarian Cultural Institute that was opened in 1973. This is this room back then. And it was also a place where uh, people would actually, during the DDR, during the German uh, kind of communist era that was, that was definitely in this area, uh, people could join, could get together here and talk about controversial topics and watch uncensored films. So that's like a neat little tidbit. So what about, what is Zero Knowledge all about? What do you think Zero Knowledge Summit is all about? I think it's all about learning. Uh, and hopefully we have a lot of great content for everyone here to learn from. It it's, will be a, a huge range from introductory topics to advanced topics. So I think it's, it'll be good. And uh, we asked a question uh, in the like application form of this. Uh, uh, when, you, when you applied to come here, we asked the question, how would you describe zero knowledge to a friend? And we got some pretty funny answers. So we were going to share a couple of these with you. We did not associate names, so don't worry. But some of them were pretty funny. Um, I would say like a lot of them were quite good. Um, some of them were kind of funny, I guess. So this one's a good one. A way to prove you know something without revealing what it is. Lol. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get that part so much. This was good. Two people being able to say to each other, I know that you know, and only that. <laughs> uh, to the question, how would you explain zero knowledge to a friend? We got the, I have no friends. <laughs> I know where you are. <laughs> um, there was a lot of talk of magic magically prove that you are of legal drinking age without revealing your date of birth to a bartender. There was a lot of mentions of magic and a lot of mentions of legal drinking age. Actually, both of those came up quite a few times. This one I didn't catch right away, but with ZK proofs, I can give you a mathematical argument about some secret that I know and convince you 100%, but you still learn nothing about that secret. I liked mathematical. 
that was an answer. Two balls and a colorblind friend. <laughs> it's like the beginning of a joke right there. This one too. <laughs> Ali Papa Cave for fun and profit. It's like saying, I know how to sing, but I don't have to sing to you. This is a good one. Look at it closely. It's slightly murdery. <laughs> I don't, that's fair too. Uh, this is a thought, uh, it's a bit of a longer one. Cre I like the creepy assumptions in that. Nice. This, this was a few of them too. Even though I have a vague idea, I would fumble at the explanation, get blank stares, and then it's hoping this conference helps me with it, and we hope that as well. Um, cool, so I think, what we want to do now is just say thank you to some of the people who helped make this happen. Uh, this uh, edition is uh, our one of our our main our main sponsor is Decrypt Capital. Uh, this has been a very cool uh, partnership. They are focused on they're an investment firm focused on uh, privacy preserving technologies, and we just felt like this was such a cool connection point, and I really want to say thank you to Decrypt Capital for coming on board. Um, our gold sponsors are New Cipher and Least Authority. So New Cipher is a data layer for blockchains and decentralized applications that gives developers a way to store, share, and manage private data. And Least Authority is a Berlin-based company that supports people's rights to privacy through security consulting and building secure solutions. And actually, it was a convert. So New Cypher was here last time. I know their session was super popular last time, so I'm so glad you guys are back. And Liz from Least Authority sort of helped. I mean, the framing of this event came a little bit through conversations that we had. So I don't know if, if Liz is already here, but anyway, it's really great that we had those conversations. Do you want to share the other ones? Well, we also have a bunch of other great sponsors. Uh, and obviously, we want to thank everyone from Parity, POA Network, 1KX, Zcash, and uh, the VPN Private Internet Access, who decided to sponsor us as well. I want to say a shout out to the team who's kind of come together in the last few days around this event. Um, and a big thanks to Lorenzo, who's dealt with a lot of my uh, being late to things, and like he's helped me get organized, so I want to say thanks to him for that. And thanks to you. And, thanks and to you for guys. the record, Anna has done most of the work for this <laughs> conference. I'm really just here being a pretty face. <laughs> um, yeah, back to the program. Uh, I think, yeah, I think what we can do right now is basically just show what's coming up right after this. We're about two minutes late, so I think we're not too bad. Um, but we're going to start with uh, Ariel Gabison's from Zcash's talk here on the main stage about Zcash and ZK Snarks. There's an identity roundtable starting in breakout one, run by Garrett and Paul. And then Awa is going to be doing um, something on proof of stake in the sidechain stage three, which is all the way at the end of the hall. So yeah, I hope you guys choose what you want to watch. And just once again, this is the Wi-Fi. So you didn't have to take a picture. I was going to show it again. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So thank you guys so much. And I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Ariel. Ariel. No, I said it wrong. <laughs> It's, it's like, like don't thing. think about yeah, it's like thing. If I, if I do it, if I do yeah. it. Okay, thanks. Just see how this works. Okay, it works. Uh, 
Okay, so th uh, this is going to be a introduction, but uh, you know, kind of maybe adapted to the crowd here. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try to give some intuitions about how the, the Zcash protocol works and, and how uh, SNARKs work. Uh, okay, so so the Zcash uh, protocol. Uh, let's let's go uh, for a second to, to Bitcoin and think of it uh, through the, the following analogy. So right, the main object there is the unspent transaction output set. And you can think of that as some uh, bowl that uh, everybody can see what's in the bowl. And, and this bowl, bowl contains uh, everybody's unspent coins. Uh, and what is a coin, right? A coin is like uh, an address and, uh, and a value. And, and let's assume for simplicity that all, all coins are, are one dollar. Right, so at some given point in time, these are the, the, the current uh, unspent coins. Alice has two, Bob has two. Uh, and so how does payment happen in Bitcoin when you're thinking about it like this? Uh, Alice wants to pay Bob, so uh, she, she creates like a new Bob coin. She puts it inside the bowl, and at the same time, she takes out an Alice coin. And the, the idea is that uh, since everybody's looking at the bowl, everybody can see that, yeah, she really took out one of her coins, and she put in what she, what she took out, so, uh, so everything is fine. But of course, you have uh, there's no privacy in, in such a system at all because everybody is looking at this uh, bull. Uh, so, in in Zcash, you, you can think of it that uh, we replace this bull by an opaque box, so you, you can't see into the box. This is just for the presentation, uh, and and think of this box as having uh, you know, a small opening on the top. So, so this is a box that you can you can drop things into, uh, but but you can't take anything out once it's in, and and you can't uh, look inside. Um, so, and and also think that we've added to to each coin some uh, some random serial number. We've chosen some random number and added it to the to the coin. Uh, but think of all these coins still as, as one dollar coins. So, so the big difference so far from Bitcoin, uh, one big di difference is that, you know, once something is inside the box, you, you, you can't take it out. And of course, you can't look into the box. Uh, all right, so uh, we need some way to distinguish between spent coins and unspent coins, right? Uh, so uh, we're going to add next to this box uh, a list. This list, everybody can see the, the list. Uh, and what, what does this list contain? It contains the serial numbers of all coins that have been spent up to this point. So say at a certain point in time, out of these five coins, only this coin of Alice was spent. So, so this list will, will contain uh, just this number, four, four to one. And uh, right, this, this serial number, it's just a random number. It doesn't give you the, the ID of the, uh, of the coin holder. Uh, okay, now the right. The question is: So, how does Alice pay Bob in such a system? Uh, so, yeah, like in Bitcoin, she's just going to create a, a Bob coin, and she wants to now drop it in in the box. Uh, but before she drops it into the box, we we ask Alice to write a new number on the list, a number that's different from what's on the list so far. And what is this number Alice is writing on the list? It's a serial number 
of some coin of hers that's still unspent. So, for example, if Alice is going to use this coin to, to make this payment now, uh, she's going to add this uh, serial number to the list. Uh, all right, so, right, so basically the idea is instead of preventing double spending by taking spent coins out of the, uh, of the bowl, we prevent dub double spending by requiring, requiring uh, unique numbers on this list. Uh, but of course, at this point, th this could all be nonsense because uh, we, we don't see into this box, so how do I know that this number that Alice is writing on the list is not some completely random made up number that doesn't have anything to do with, with anything. And you know, as, as you can guess, the, the answer in, uh, in two words is uh, ZK snarks. So Alice will, will somehow use uh, ZK snarks uh, to prove that this number she's writing now on the list is really a serial number appearing on some coin in the box, a coin that says Alice. So that's the Zcash protocol in uh, uh, three, four minutes. And uh, now I, I want to give you some intuitions about uh, ZK snarks. So I, I like uh, the most, uh, uh, this is a kind of advanced definition of snarks uh, I heard Zuko uh, Wilcox give, uh, that uh, a snark is a, a bunch of words scientists put together, so their initials will, will spell snark. Uh, it's, a very, it's, it's an advanced crowd, so I can use that definition. Uh, it corresponds very closely to something Silvio Micali called computationally sound proofs uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 90s, uh, but snark is, is more tweetable and uh, retweetable ret than computationally sound proofs. So I want to give you some intuition about what I see as the two main uh, ingredients in, in making a snark. And the first ingredient is that we're going to move our statement to the world of polynomials. Why are we going to do that? Uh, because basically, if you tell a lie in polynomials, you need to lie most of the time. Uh, and just as a historical anecdote, this, uh, this kind of idea, it appeared first in, in a really great breakthrough work that uh, what this work allowed us to do is uh, say there's a Sudoku puzzle that there's no solution to. And I want to efficiently prove to you there's no solution to this Sudoku puzzle, right? If, forget zero knowledge for a second. If I wanted to prove to you there is a solution, I would show you the solution. Say I want to prove to you there's no solution, I want to do it quickly without you having to go through all the possibilities. So this classical work of Lund, Forno, Carl Finissan allowed to efficiently prove what's called Cohen P statements of the form, for example, uh, there is no solution to this Sudoku puzzle. So if you tell a lie in polynomials, you, you need to lie most of the time. Let's give a concrete example of, of what I mean by this. So say, for example, the, the lie you wanted to tell was, uh, you know, this program here uh, that starts, i starts from zero, and 10 times we increase i by one. Uh, I want to tell you the lie that this program outputs 11. So now I, I'm telling you, I want to tell you the story of how this program ends up outputting 11. So I tell you the story of its execution. 
uh, of how the state changed, how the value of I changed. And, you know, I tell you the story, well, you know, I, I was zero, and then we had this plus plus command, so the state of I became one. And then again, we had another plus plus command, uh, the value of I became two. I continue, you know, you're, you're getting bored, I'm just, I'm, you see I'm not lying, it's just some formality. And then when I see you're, you're a little, you know, a little bored and not listening, I say, and then suddenly at, at this, there was a point where I was six, and then, you know, there was the plus plus command, I became eight. Uh, you know, I slipped that through you, and then, you, you know, you wake up a little, and, and then I continue not lying, you know, and then, you know, I, I was eight, we, there was a plus plus command, it became nine. Uh, so, so, so the point is, uh, when we're talking about program executions, if I, I slip in, slipping in, one lie is enough to make uh, to successfully make a completely false uh, statement. I only need to to lie in one place to get a completely wrong uh, conclusion. Uh, okay, but but now the idea, and this is kind of the the, uh, the basic important idea in, in snarks, the, the first of them, is suppose I tell you now, all right, uh, tell me the story of this program executions, but tell it to me as a polynomial. What does that mean, tell it, tell it to me as a polynomial? I'm saying, well, so what is this story? It's, I can think of it as, as, a ser as 10 numbers, right? The 10 changes in the, in the state of i, in the value of i. So, you know, I have 10 values, uh, you know, what's called Lagrange interpolation. There's some degree, at most nine, polynomial that gets these 10 values, that an, uh, at these 10 uh, time points will, will output these values. So I tell you, you know, find this polynomial and, you know, tell me its values. Uh, but, you know, do me a favor, you know, tell me its, its values not on these, all, just these 10 points that correspond, uh, you know, to the program execution. If you've already found this polynomial, you know, just write to me what its values are also on, you know, on other points. And you could say, why, the value of this polynomial on other points, what does that have to do with the program? I, well, just, just do me a favor and, and, and write, write them for me. And you say, okay, so, so say you weren't lying. So what is, right, the, what is the true story? I always changes by one at any time point. So I need a function that x equals one gives me one, x equals two gives two, x equals three equals three. What's the degree at most nine polynomial uh, that gets these values? Uh, it's not too hard, it's just the polynomial, the, the, the constant one that always returns one. Uh, so, and, and how does this polynomial behave on the numbers 11, 12, what is f of x, f of 11, f of 12, f of 13? It's just one. So if I'm not lying, uh, this, this is what, what I will uh, give you. Uh, but now the important point is that say I am lying and just at this one point, you know, that I wanted to falsely claim that at this one po point I grew by two instead of one. So the point is that now my lie uh, will manifest a lot, very clearly. So, so, so now I need to find a degree nine polynomial that gets these weird values, one, 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 then suddenly two, and then three more ones. So you do what's called Lagrange interpolation. You find such a polynomial, this is just an approximation. It's gonna look something like this, 0.00, .00 something to times x to the ninth, and uh, so, uh, again, on the points one to 10, it's very close to the, to the true thing, but the point is that now outside this range, you know, the lie is gonna become very clear. The values of this polynomial are gonna be very, very, very different than uh, the, the correct one. Uh, so the, the, the point, again, with polynomials, in other words, is that once I force you to, to tell me a story in polynomials, 
if you want to check that I'm lying, it's enough to check basically at a few random points or even one uh, random point. Because my lie, when it's in, I'm telling the story in polynomials, will manifest almost everywhere. All right, so that's, and the second main ingredient in, in SNARKs is uh, what we can call homomorphically hidden uh, v verifier challenges. And uh, before saying what, what I mean by that, let, let, me, let me say what, what I mean by a uh, homomorphic hiding. So this is a, a term I kind of thought of, but then I saw that in the crypto lit literature, it, it corresponds very closely to these things called uh, k-linear maps and graded encoding schemes. And th this is very similar to homomorphic encryption, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard the term. So, so what, what does a homomorphic hiding mean? Well, it's some mapping E that it has two main properties. So uh, one property is that if I show you E of X, it's hard to find X from that. So that's what, uh, that's what hiding uh, means, right? If I show you E of X, it's hard to, to, to compute X. The reason I call it hiding and not encryption is that there's no decryption key. There's not necessarily a way to get, even if you have some, there's no key that lets you get from E to X back to X. There's, that's why I call it hiding instead of I encryption. Uh, so that's the hiding part. What, what is the, the homomorphic part? Uh, the homomorphic part, what does that mean? It means that if I say give you a hiding of X and a hiding of Y, well, it's a hiding. You can't get X or Y, uh, but you can get other hidings of arithmetic expressions in X and Y. So, for example, I give you the hiding of X and Y, you'll be able to compute the hiding of X plus Y and the, the, hidden, the hiding of X times Y. Small note, I'm simplifying, you, you, you can't actually get anything like this, we don't know, so it's going to be some E prime here instead of E. Uh, all right, so, what, so that's basically the idea of uh, homomorphic hiding. Um, now how does this, uh, and the idea in our context, what this allows you to do is this thing called uh, blind polynomial evaluation. What, what, what does that mean? It means, say that the prover has some polynomial, uh, right? So what, uh, let's think, where, where were we at? We were at this stage where we know, okay, if I force the prover to tell me the story in polynomials, it's enough for me to check him at one random point. Uh, but there's a little chicken and egg problem here of who goes first. Because if I say to the prover, okay, I'm going to check you at x equals 13, what's your polynomial? The, the prover can craft a lie that looks good on x equals 13. On the other hand, if uh, the prover goes first, he said, okay, I'm sending you all my polynomial. We got two problems with that. One problem is, right, snarks, the S stands for succinct. We want small proofs. These polynomials of the prover, they're, they're going to be huge. And the second problem is we'll lose zero knowledge. For example, in Zcash, the prover polynomial it contains all the information on the addresses, the values of the transaction. And so, the, the kind of the, the, the clever way people figured out how to, uh, how to solve this chicken and egg problem is, okay, the verifier in a sense will, will go first. He'll give the challenge point first, but he won't give it in plain form. He'll give it in this homomorphically hidden form. And, and what does that do? That, I'm glossing over a lot of details, uh, but basically that creates a situation where on the one hand, since it's hidden, the prover can't 
adapt their answer to the challenge. They can't choose a polynomial that will work well on, that, on the specific point of the verifier because it's hidden. But on the other hand, since it's homomorphically hidden, the prover can still, if his polynomial is P, can still compute the hiding of P of S, just uh, where S is the challenge point, just from the hiding of S and some hidings of, of powers of S to be completely, uh, um, to be more accurate. How, how is the time situation? I got basically one more slide. I'm good, all right. Uh, it's actually a trick if you want speakers to go fast, don't show them how much time is left because they'll assume there's, well maybe it depends on the speaker. It, uh, but I'm, I'm guessing it made me go a little faster. Uh, so, so that's the, the basic idea and I want to tell you uh, one more thing about, so right, uh, people call snarks uh, moon math. So, so where is the, exactly the moon in the, uh, in the moon math? And uh, in my opinion, sorry, I make, in my opinion, the, the real magic is in these uh, things called elliptic curve pairings, which were, you know, developed by mathematicians who didn't, probably know or care about cryptography. They cared about like the Riemann hypothesis and proving things about uh, prime numbers. And uh, so elliptic curve pairings are where the, a lot of the math magic happens. These, uh, this pairing, it gives you this, this thing. You, you have, uh, you know, two groups, G and what's called the, the tar GT. And the discrete log is hard in these groups. So if I show you g to the x, you can't find x. I show you g to the y, you, you can't find y. Uh, but uh, this, this pair of groups, to get, this, these groups, they have this magical property that you could say kind of partially kind of contradicts the classic Diffie-Hellman protocol. So uh, basically, it, it, this pairing map, what does it allow me to do? If you give me uh, g to the x and uh, g to the y, I can compute from that. I can't compute exactly g to the x times y, right? That would like totally contradict uh, computational uh, Diffie-Hellman. But I can, in this other group, what's called the target group of the pairing, I can, in that group, I can efficiently compute x, y to, to the exponent. So for some generator of this group, from, from these two guys, I can actually compute h to the uh, x times y. Um, okay, so uh, I think I'll, yeah, I'll just open, a any questions about, by the way, anything Zcash related or uh, not just the talk? Tamar, okay, yeah? What exactly, um, so, so we had the Zcash example. Um, yeah. Yeah, let me go back. Is the fact that it's Bob's coin hidden as well? Um, so what is the throwing of that coin? What, what about it is, is it also not known? Can, can you repeat the question? Please? All right. So in this example where Alice is paying Bob, uh, how hidden or what is hidden about uh, Bob's coin? Uh, so the sender, like Alice, will know the value of the coin and the address of the coin, like she'll know it's Bob. Uh, but this uh, serial number, like the way I did it here, 
so for example, Alice does know, she made this coin, so, so she does know the serial number, the 627. And when Bob spends it and writes 627, Alice will know Bob spent her coin. In the real Zcash protocol, only Bob knows this 627. Because this 627, it's actually going to be some combination of Bob's uh, secret key uh, and, and the coin. So how do you prove that the, the coin with the serial number is on the list? Like what, what proof, ZK proof do we produce? Okay, so what you have actually is, so you have, uh, you publish, when, when I create the Bob coin, I publish the hash of the coin or a commitment to the, so the hash of the coin. And everybody stores this Merkle tree whose leaves are the hashes of the coins. Uh, and also, uh, this list is, is public. So, uh, Alice will prove, when, when Alice uh, spends uh, this coin, she will prove, I know some, you know, coin, such that if I, and some path in the tree, such that if I take the hash of this coin that I know, and I, I follow this path of hashes, I will reach this root that we all agree is the, is the root of the tree of all the coin commitments. Of, uh, and at the same time, Alice will prove uh, this uh, oh, and uh, she will also prove, and this coin that I know a path to the root, the, the serial number, or as we call it, nullifier of this coin, is what I wrote on this list. So does that mean that the entire Merkle tree is an input to the ZK uh, function? Uh, no, so just the root of the Merkle tree. Okay. So the root of the Merkle tree is what's called a public input to the circuit, and the path from your specific coin is a private input to the circuit. Any other questions? Hi there. Um, so, just going back to that example when Alice is sending a zero knowledge proof that she owns a coin that. Um, is part of the Merkle tree. How does she create Bob's coin if she doesn't know what the nullifier is because she doesn't know the secrets? So, um, so the, uh, the nullifier, or what I called your serial number, yeah, let's call it nullifier, is a hash, basically, of the coin that Alice does know and Bob's uh, secret key. So Alice doesn't know Bob's coin, Bob's nullifier, but she doesn't need, she doesn't need to know it. It's only important that when Bob spends the coin, he will know the nullifier because he will need to publish it and prove that it's correct. Uh, but uh, an important point here is that when Alice creates Bob's coin, she doesn't actually need to know the nullifier. All she needs to convince us is that the value of, she doesn't need to know the value of the coin, mm. and that's all. She just needs to convince us that the value of this coin that I've dropped is not larger than the value of the coin I've added to the list. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit slow, just off the plane. Uh, sure. Deprived. Um, <laughs> but um, does, does that mean that, does Bob need to give Alice a bit of information in order to make that coin? Uh, just his address. Um, the coin is basically mm -hmm. address, uh, value, and some randomness that uh, Alice chose uh, to, to make the hash of the coin more random. Okay. I think I understand. Cool. Thanks. We have time for one more question, if there is one. I think you got... Over oh. there. You mentioned something interesting that uh, coins can have different values, and then you can spend a coin with, like, you can transfer it to another coin with lesser value. Yeah. Is this exact protocol of Zcash? Yeah. So, in the actual protocol, 
uh, I can add a few numbers to this list in a transaction and I can drop a few coins to the box and then in the zero in the circuit I check that the total value of coins I've added to the list is larger or equal to the total value of coins I've dropped in the box. So is this larger equal actually used to hide the, the value transfers because otherwise I could track like if, if somebody spends exact same amount of coins like I, I, I could try to, to build an algorithm to track the origins oh. of, the, of the funds. I, is this used or not? Oh, sorry, I think I said larger equal for simplicity. I think it's actually, actually that's a good idea maybe to use that for some extra hiding. Uh, but I think I should double check. I think it's actually exactly equal and everything else like goes to, into the transparent pool if there's any change. All right, thank you very much. Let's give Ariel a big round of applause. Thanks. All right. Next up, if this was not friendly enough for you, we have towards friendlier snarks with uh, Socrates. Uh, as a side note, we actually have a podcast episode coming out today covering Socrates and what it is. So uh, if this um, presentation tickles your fancy, you can listen to that episode. Give a big round of applause for Thibaut, um, presenting Socrates. Hi everyone, um, I'm Thibaut Schaeffer, um, today I'm going to be talking about Socrates, uh, so giving kind of a general introduction for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the tool and also kind of talk about some of the concepts and ideas we've been working on recently. Uh, again, yeah, check out the episode that's going to come out soon uh, uh, with Zero Knowledge Podcast, um, that should be a good one. Um, so before I start, I should mention uh, Zocritus was started, was started in, uh, at TU Berlin and we're proud to have had the support of the Ethereum Foundation since the start. Um, so with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. Um, so one way we like to think about it is that uh, in the blockchain space, since Bitcoin we've basically seen two main trends. Uh, one trend is towards more generality with uh, uh, Ethereum and smart contracts and everyone can write whatever they want and you have all this freedom and privacy on the other side. With Zcash, um, with um, kind of more private systems, uh, what we think at Zocritus is that by combining those two aspects, uh, we're likely to bring more innovation into the space and to let developers come up with uh, the, the, the actual interesting use cases. So we really want to be up there on the right on this graph. However, if you look at Zcash, uh, there's amazing uh, systems being built at Zcash. However, for the average developer, it's still really, really hard to get started with uh, zero knowledge proofs um, because the abstractions are being used are very, very low level and very close to what you would be doing uh, with uh, a, a, an actual circuit board um, where actually you would want something a little bit more high level and developer friendly to, to get started. Um, so we want to enable developers to write privacy preserving applications and uh, maybe I can kind of give a quick overview of what that could be uh, even though of course the use cases will be found by the developers eventually. Um, so in general approving facts on private data is something that, that, that you can do with those systems. Um, in particular, uh, proving membership in a, uh, in, in a Merkle tree, 
um, shielded token schemes, um, schemes such, such as the, the Zcash scheme as well, uh, commitment schemes, and finally, uh, maybe another type of use case that we were also uh, looking at, which is not directly linked to uh, privacy itself, but it's compression. Uh, so taking, for example, a number of proofs uh, that were generated like, like normal uh, using other tools and kind of take those proofs at input and then compress them to have one single succinct proof that kind of sums up all those uh, proofs as input. And we have some uh, some projects who are using Zocritus to, to, to do that. Um, for more on the applications, we have a panel this afternoon that's, that will go more into what people are actually building with those systems. Um, so, um, given all those applications, the, the, the space, and especially the Ethereum uh, community thought, oh, that, that would be great to be able to use those tools. Um, however, they require some cryptographic primitives that are quite specific. And uh, for those familiar with, the, with Ethereum, on Ethereum, you can only use this EVM, the, the virtual machine, and actually implementing those primitives on the, on the, on the EVM was really, really costly in terms of gas. Um, so last September, uh, last year, uh, there was a hard fork in uh, Ethereum, which introduced three, uh, basically three new uh, primitives in, in, in the form of um, precompiles, what we call precompiles, which are basically um, primitives that you can call from the EVM, but that can be much more complex and for which you pay just a fraction of the cost because they're not executed on the virtual machine itself, but they're executed natively on the host. So you kind of have a huge savings on that. And those primitives were um, elliptic curve uh, operations on uh, LBN, uh, which is the curve that's currently used in, uh, in, in Zcash. So including uh, pairing checks. And pairing checks are known for being uh, kind of the underlying crypt cryptographic uh, tool necessary to use uh, the current zero-knowledge uh, systems, such as the one used by uh, Zcash. So that was added uh, into Ethereum, uh, making it possible for anyone to uh, go and start doing zero-knowledge proofs uh, on Ethereum. However, that did not really happen, uh, because they were just introduced as this very, very low-level uh, primitive, but there was no way uh, anyone could actually take that and actually build something on top, because it was so, so low level, you, you didn't even have the, the, the proving system, you just had this very kind of uh, basic primitive. So yeah, here's some tools, go and use them. It's actually not that easy. So that's where uh, Zocritus comes in. Uh, and what we actually built is uh, a domain specific language where you can define your computation, your privacy preserving computation. So Ariel talked about like public inputs and private inputs. That's something you can um, define directly in the Zocritus program. So here we have the main function, and the main function has inputs. The first input is private, which means that when you're going to generate proofs, this value A will not be revealed, and has also public inputs, so the value H will be revealed. And in this case, what we're doing in this program is proving that we know the pre-image of a given hash. So you kind of feed um, your secret pre-image A and you feed the public uh, hash H, and then you basically return one if the hash of A is equal to, to the public uh, hash. And then you have some hash function that you can define in Zocritus as well, and so on. So trying to have this very like high level um, abstraction for people to build on. So what it looks like in general is a whole pipeline of tools. Uh, so starting from uh, the domain specific language, um, uh, we have tools to, gen to uh, actually um, run a setup phase, uh, similar to one run in Zcash, uh, which um, generates two different things. One thing is a prover, and the prover is basically a piece of software that will be run let's say on the client of the prover, or whoever wants to uh, use uh, the application. So in Zcash, that could be someone wanting to spend some uh, coins. Um, and that's something that's completely um, independent from any blockchain. It's just a piece of software that lets you generate proofs. And uh, the other piece of software that we generate in the other target is a, uh, a verifier. 
typically. And uh, what we built is that our verifier is actually a, a, a piece of uh, Solidity code that you can deploy directly to a blockchain so that end-to-end uh, -end you could have someone generating um, a proof um, on the client, for example, proving that they are above 18, and then sending this proof to a smart contract, and the smart contract could just take this proof and say, okay, uh, this is valid, and do some access control based on that. So this is a kind of use case that we're looking at uh, currently. So great, we have this, uh, this tool, we have this high-level language, um, so we can start writing all our programs in it, and, and everything will be fine. So that's basically what we did, so we wrote um, as seen in the previous example, we, we wrote, uh, we implemented a hash function, uh, especially uh, the SHA-256 compression function, so just one round of SHA-256. And here's how it went. Um, so as you can see, our uh, implementation has, our kind of naive implementation has uh, 250,000 constraints. And in the case of, um, of those uh, systems, the more constraints you have, the less efficient your, uh, your system is. Because if you have a lot of constraints, it's, it's going to take a lot of time for the prover to generate the proof, and for the setup as, as well to be executed. Um, whereas um, Lipsnar Gadgets, which is uh, the kind of, li the, the kind of uh, library that most uh, developers use currently, has an implementation of uh, Shadow 56 in just 27,000 constraints. So of course, our implementation is very naive, and we could have more optimizations, um, but our approach is to say, oh, we have this great implementation already, why not just try and kind of import that into Zocritus and see how we can kind of interoperate between, between those two. So our goal is going to be to find kind of a common language between those two tools, uh, kind of um, Zocritus and other tools such as Lipsnark. Um, so we looked at what good candidates we could have for this kind of interoperability between the different tools. And you can see it as Zocritus and the Lipsnar gadgets kind of standing on top of this common abstraction, which is basically arithmetic circuits. And arithmetic circuits uh, can be represented in this form called R1CS, or rank, rank one constraint systems, which is actually pretty simple. It's just a list of so-called constraints, and each constraint is sort of a an equation like this, um, where you can have one multiplication, so here W times this kind of product, and so only one, let's say, on the left, and, and no multiplication on the right, and then the elements that you multiply need to be only linear combinations, so like a sum of factors of your variables, right? So you, in terms of arithmetic circuits, you can think of it as uh, a circuit that has uh, plus gates and, and uh, multiplication gates. And in this case, uh, the, what each variable is, it's a variable that lives in a, in a prime field, which is basically a field that has, uh, which, whose size is a prime, a very big prime, right? So this, this is a very simple abstraction. And it's a, okay, let's, let's use that, we just, take the Let's Not Gadget, just compile it to R1CS, take that, feed it into Zocritus, and there we, there we go, we have our 27,000 constraint um, hash function. Um, so when we did our implementation uh, of uh, SHAT56, we were basically very close to R1CS, saying, okay, we create a first constraint, and we set some, some of the values, uh, some of the variables to some values, and then in the next constraint, we can reuse some of the variables and say, okay, this is another constraint. And then by going through all the constraints, you can find a solution to the system, right? So just looking at R1CS, you can actually write complete programs. However, if we look at um, something that we would want to do, um, which is turning a number into its uh, bit representation, and that's something that's really useful, especially in the case of SHA-256, because SHA-256 is based on bits, so you, actually, yeah, you absolutely need to, to have a way to kind of represent bits in the, to, to implement this algorithm. And it turns out that if you want to take a number, which is living in this kind of prime field, so it's just like an integer, and you want from that to output the bits that represent this number, and imagine you only have this abstraction that we had before, 
uh, which is just a bunch of constraints that are just multiplication and additions. Actually, it's going to be really, really hard uh, if you just has those, have those tools to go from a number to its bit, re bit representation. Um, but here we can see um, what's actually being used in the systems in order to have efficient circuits, and it's the following. It's to say, instead of executing um, the kind of bit decomposition in the circuit, I'm going to have this first line with, with the, the kind of the hashtag there, um, where I just set two new variables, C1 and C2, to being the result, right? So it's really easy, like off the circuit, um, to find a bit representation of, of, of a number. Um, and then, this is not enough, right? If I just come up with two values, then I could come up with anything. And then I could, I could even put like five and, and, and four, which, uh, which wouldn't make sense. So then the, the important thing is to then, once I have uh, the result of the computation, I need to have a, a bunch of constraints that make sure that this result is actually correct. So in this case, if I come up with C1 and C2, which are the bit representation of C, then I need to check three things. I need to check that C is actually equal to uh, C1 times one plus C2 times two, right? And that's actually just one constraint. It kind of, uh, it, um, it works in our current abstraction of just being one constraint to the system. And then I also need to check that C1 and C2 are actually either zero or one, right? Because I want to make sure that those are actually bits. So to do that, we use a strict where you just make sure that the square of the number is equal to the number. Because zero times zero is zero, one times one is one, and there's no other number that uh, satisfies uh, this equation in a, in a prime field. So the kind of general idea is to say, okay, we have this computation, but actually a lot of the times it's way more efficient to do the computation of the circuit and then just verify the computation in the circuit. And that's what we're doing here, where we can do uh, bit decomposition into three constraints. And if you have more bits, it actually scales uh, linearly. All right? Um, so this is something that was not captured in the R1CS. R1CS just told you uh, that those are the lines. So those are pretty much what R1CS is. But R1CS doesn't give you this, kind of the way to solve the system. And that's something that we also need to carry if we want to interoperate between different systems. Right? So, from that, we came up with this very simple abstraction where you have basically two, just two things in uh, circuits. Um, one thing is assertions, and assertions you can think of them as being the exact same thing as R1CS, it's just a bunch of constraints, a bunch of uh, equations that need to hold. And you have solvers, which are um, ways for someone running the program to find actually which values to set to the variables before they can check the constraints. And those two things are necessary so that we can kind of take advantage of all the, 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 the power of the, like, the Shadfish 6 Lipsnark um, implementation. Um, so we kind of took that approach and applied it to Shadfish 56, and this is what we ended up with. We have basically a Zocritus function, which is a wrapper around uh, the Shadfish 6 Lipsnark. So the way it works is that um, SHA-256, in our case, takes uh, 512 inputs. I have one too many here. Um, so it takes your inputs, and then you have this solver. So nothing happens on the circuit itself, but the solver just um, takes the whole constraint system for uh, SHA-256 in LIMSNARC and just sets every single variable of the system to what it should be, right? So based on your inputs, it sets all the variables, like all the intermediate variables. Uh, there's actually like 27,000 variables. It sets them to some values. And then um, that's something that's executed in LipSnark. So from Zocritus, we actually do a call to LipSnark to say, hey, what's the solution to this big constraint system for, um, for those inputs? And um, 
Lipsum is going to give, give us an answer, okay, this, those are the, all the values you need to have. But then, that, again, that's not enough, so we need to add all the constraints. And again, those constraints, we can get them from Lipsum because Lipsum has the whole circuit. And then we can just verify those constraints. And in the end, we just return whatever subset of all the intermediate variables is our actual output, in this case, the 256 uh, bits. So we have this in, in, in Zocritus, and this, that's kind of first step that, that, that we took in this direction. But we actually want to go um, further um, to actually have a real way for systems to uh, inter interoperate. And for the R1CS part, for the constraints part, this is actually really easy because it's just a bunch of constraints. But in this case, uh, when we uh, did our SHA-256 integration, we were still calling from, Lips, from, from Zocritus to Lipsnar to get the, the, solu the, the witness, to get the, the solution to the system. And it would be actually great if, um, if you could actually get the solution to the system without having Lipsnar at all. So the idea would be to instead ex export from Lipsnar the witness generation, this kind of solver bit, and kind of um, have that alongside the constraint system so that you could directly import and have the the witness generation in, included. So what we experimented with, so of course the Lipsnark solvers, which I described earlier. Um, inside Zocritus, we also have um, uh, solvers that are being used inside the language, in some cases, to, uh, to, for, to kind of resolve the, the constraint system, and they're written in Rust. Um, and one idea we have is to use uh, WebAssembly in order for um, all the different tools to compile their solvers so that then you just need to have um, a WebAssembly runtime so that you can run um, the, the solvers for your system. And that doesn't have any security um, implications because the whole um, security of your system relies on the constraints and not on the witness generation. So having something that's really, really portable uh, here makes, uh, makes sense to us. So that's, that's something we're looking at as well. Um, so in terms of the kind of next steps that we're looking at, uh, so having more stuff on interoperability, making it easier for those systems to interoperate to, um, so that we don't have to re-implement SHA uh, um, in every single toolbox, but instead we can share those implementations. Um, we're also working on a type system. So we have two main reasons why we're working on type systems. So in the current version of uh, Zocritus, there's only one type, which is the field elements. Um, but this can be very cumbersome for developers to work with, especially if you're talking about um, a hash function, then you have like 256 outputs. That's not really easy to work with. So the first kind of type that we would want to have is kind of static arrays, uh, so that you can actually, in Zocritus, have this array which represent a number of values, and then this gets compiled down to the actual field elements. And there's a second use case um, where the type system is going to be really interesting is for safety itself. So um, when you're talking about bits, you always need to make sure that whatever variable uh, represent a bit, so in this case, the C1 and the C2 here, all of this only makes sense if C1 and C2 are 0 or 1. And that's something that we we're looking at enforcing in the type system itself, so that if in Zocritus you allocate a bit, then it's going to automatically make sure that this bit is always 0, 1 all the way through in your program. Um, finally, integrating with other backends is something we're looking at. So currently, we, have, we target uh, Ethereum with a specific um, proof system and a specific curve, but um, there is no reason why we couldn't just take Zocritus and target a different curve or a different proof system as long as it, it's based on uh, the R1CS uh, abstraction. Um, then just a quick wish list for the ecosystem at large because we start having uh, people working on those tools and, and, and some stuff that, I, that we think could be uh, interesting for space. So first there's this uh, tool called uh, Bellman which is the library developed by Zcash. Um, which does both uh, kind of circuit generation and also uh, proving. And that's something that uh, is really interesting for us for many reasons, one of them being that it's uh, based on Rust and we're also building on Rust. Um, another thing is that they use uh, the concept of streaming the constraints so that you, can, you have actually uh, a reduced memory usage uh, compared to, to, to other proving tools. 
Um, the kind of the drawback of Bellman is that it is developed inside Zcash, so it's very focused on the Zcash use cases. So it only supports one curve, it only supports one proof system. So if we can have Bellman as a kind of community tool that people build on and, and add more proof systems and more curves, uh, there's already some uh, people interested in adding uh, the Albion curve to Bellman, which would, which would be awesome as well. Uh, then in terms of the curves themselves, uh, embracing BLS 12, 381, it uh, could be super interesting as well. Uh, that's something we're also looking at, but uh, in terms of the support currently, it's pretty restricted to, to the kind of uh, Zcash community, so it'd be, it would be great to have more implementation of uh, BLS 12.381, and that's something that the Ethereum Foundation is also interested in, so if you're interested in uh, porting BLS 12.381 uh, uh, to a different language, uh, just reach out, uh, I, can, I can help on that. Also, having more developers, because there's so much stuff to do, like it's pretty much uh, kind of open territory now, so we have interesting topics if you, if, if you want to work on those things, and yeah, there's just so much stuff to do. And finally, sharing, I think, is something that's really uh, important, because right now, the community kind of benefits of uh, all the great work that the Libsnore people have been doing and the Zcash people have been doing on Bellman, uh, but we could use more uh, sharing, like uh, events like today or um, the kind of Zcon uh, conference in Montreal, also meetups. So I'm also looking at ways that people can connect more and share their experience with the system so that we can build best practices and have actual uh, use cases out there. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, you can join this afternoon. We have a panel on the use cases them, them, themselves, and also definitely check out the tool and come talk to me if you have any kind of disagreement on anything I said. I'm definitely interested to, to hear your perspective. Thank you. So I think if there's any questions, I'm going to be running around with the mic. Thanks for a great talk. So two questions. First, you mentioned the uh, SHA-256. So it's ready now, it can be used. Right? Yeah, we have, uh, so we have two implementation. One is uh, Zoktis native implementation, which is not efficient. And we have a uh, integration with Lipsnark that you can use. I can kind of show you how to, to use it. It's, it's not on master yet, but it's uh, available already. Cool. Uh, and second question is, you mentioned the types, which can be Boolean in the future, but now currently you only support uh, the, the fields. So uh, the operators are also just arithmetic circuits. So I don't have logical operators. Is that correct? So I, I have to implement logical operators myself with the arithmetical stuff. Uh, at the moment, it's the case, but once we have types, you would definitely have XOR and, and all those operators. Uh, so can you estimate the, the ETA for this? Um, that's something we're working on now. Um, we want to we wanna be sure we get it right, but it should be this year. Okay, thanks. Okay, all the way back. Thank you. So, my question is on the... Um, Trusted setup. You said you can make the trusted set setup in uh, Socrates, but if I set up the trusted setup, it's not really trusted. So, could you use the zk uh, the zcash uh, trusted setup for the SHA example? So that's something that would be really interest interesting to do. That's some something we don't have at the moment. Uh, we only have the centralized setup. Um, there are some use cases which uh, work with a, a centralized setup, especially if you're doing the setup and you're, you're the verifier. So in some cases, it's okay to have the trusted, trusted setup. But uh, if you're interested to, to work on having a more decentralized setup in Zocritus, that's definitely something we, we would support. And uh, yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any ideas for ETH Berlin projects, like size, like hackathon size projects that uh, we could attempt to do with Socrates? Sure. Um, there is one proposal for a project which is more about Socrates itself to uh, integrate Socrates with Remix. So that's more on the kind of developer tool side of things. Uh, in terms of uh, kind of toy project that you could use, that, that you could do during a hackathon, um, 
Yeah, I think you could already use kind of hash functions, see what you can do with, with uh, hash functions uh, in, in general. Uh, I know there's some people from Gnosis in, in the room that also have some very interesting ideas. So maybe kind of connect with them. And, uh, and also this afternoon, we're going to have this panel. So maybe we'll have some ideas after that. Cool. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, in the context of verifying Merkle proofs, uh, what needs to be added on Socrates to be able to do the verification efficiently? And ideally, if we could do the proof generation for multiple proofs in one, like a recursive uh, setup thing? Um, do you mean recursive snarks? Uh, I, I have heard of the name, but I'm not sure if that's what you would want. Uh, ideally, a way to make multi multiple Merkle proofs of inclusion in one proof? Okay, um, I don't see anything that would prevent you from doing that based on a hash function. So you could take a hash function in Socrates and then implement a Merkle tree on top of that and then use that. Uh, so I think you, you, could, you could do it today and we have people who, who did similar stuff. Okay. Um, if there aren't any more questions, we can take a Okay, we'll give you one more, but uh, then we can take a little break uh, before Howard Wu comes up and talks about Dizik. So in EVM, there is a pre-compiled contract with this trusted setup based on Zcash trusted setup, is that correct? Um, so your trusted setup is not based on the curve, it's based on the circuit. And in this case, each developer comes up with the circuit, so typically you would do the trusted setup. So whoever sets up the, smart, the kind of verifier um, does the, the trusted setup. Uh, but what about the e EVM precompiled contract? Oh, the precompiled contract is only for the pairing checks. Okay. And the pairing checks are used in the process of verifying a proof. But they don't, they don't have any trusted setup. It's oh, just, okay. It's just okay. uh, EC uh, cryptography. Okay, yeah. thanks. Cool, cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So. We're going to be back here in about 15 minutes uh, for our last talk before lunch. See you soon. I'm really excited to introduce Howard Wu, who's going to be talking about Dizik. Uh, we actually got a chance to sit down with Howard, um, I think, three weeks ago or so, and do an episode on... Well, we were talking about ZK Snarks, but we did get a chance to touch on this, so I'm definitely excited about this talk. Cool. Take it away. Thanks. Um, hi, so uh, I'm Howard and um, I'm a researcher at uh, Skipper Lab in Berkeley and also a partner at the Crypt. Um, today I'm going to be talking about DISIC and uh, DISIC is a distributed zero knowledge proof system. Um, this is joint work actually done with uh, Wenting, Alessandro, Raluca and Jan. Um, to begin with, you're probably asking and uh, we've also had a lot of great uh, discussions earlier today on what is a zero knowledge proof. And I will give you my rendition on this. Um, a zero knowledge proof involves two parties. You have a prover and a verifier. And uh, both the prover and the verifier know some public function f, as well as uh, a claimed output y. And the prover says, hey, I know x such that f of x is equal to y. You can think of x as your private input in this case. And the verifier wants to be convinced of this, and so he or she will then challenge the prover. They play this interactive game with each other, after which time the prover will convince the verifier if indeed they know this secret. Now, there's one particular type of zero-knowledge proof that has recently gained a significant amount of attention, and this is ZK Snarks. Um, a ZK Snark is a zero-knowledge proof with a few additional guarantees. Um, for one, you have non-interactivity, so what this means is that the prover only needs uh, to provide a proof to convince the verifier that they know the private input x. Um, secondly, you have succinctness, and what this means is that the proof itself is small in size, and uh, the verification time here is fast. Now, one particular type of ZK snark that we're going to talk about today and also is very commonly used in deployment today in industry is that of pre-processing ZK snarks. And a pre-processing ZK snark has a function, uh, a setup, sorry, that uh, takes as input a public function f and it produces two outputs. One is a proving key and the other is a verification key. 
Um, I try to use size here to show kind of the, the differences in costs on memory and time. And um, the proving key here is going to be significantly larger than the verification key. Now, ZK SNARKs in general have many interesting applications, uh, two of which we will discuss today. So the first application that we're going to look at is peer-to-peer um, -peer payments. And suppose you have Alice and Bob. Um, Alice wants to pay Bob, let's say, a dollar. And uh, she may use a blockchain to facilitate this payment. Um, as you will commonly think, um, this would actually reveal a lot of information. Uh, first off, you learn about uh, the addresses that are involved. And so you learn that Alice is the sender, that Bob is the receiver, and that the payment amount here is for a dollar. Um, instead, what you could do is actually encrypt the contents of the payment. Um, and so if you do that, then you could actually get anonymous peer-to-peer -peer payments. But to uh, ensure the validity of the payment, in this case, you would use a zero-knowledge proof, a ZK SNARK, uh, that would be attached with the transaction to ensure that those encrypted contents indeed are valid and justify a proper payment. Um, this is a protocol called ZeroCash, and uh, it's manifested in industry as Zcash. Um, Let's look at a second application. So suppose you want to use a smart contract to run a publicly verifiable computation. Uh, we actually just saw in the previous talk with Socrates a very nice uh, demonstration of uh, potential use cases um, and potential uh, uh, directions for ZK SNARKs in, in terms of Ethereum. And the, the issue is that today, when you invoke a smart contract, um, you have to require all the validators to rerun this computation. Um, so a, a more scalable approach is actually for the caller to run the computation off-chain and instead uh, send along the result along with the proof attesting to the validity of the result. Then the validators would only need to check the proof, which we've established uh, here is cheap. Now, these are only uh, two applications of zero-knowledge proofs, and uh, don't be offended if your favorite application wasn't presented here. Uh, these two applications were actually chosen very specifically uh, to motivate our problem, which I'm now going to address. So we have some good news and some bad news. Uh, the, it, it, well, if we plot the circuit sizes of the applications that we just discussed, we'll see that the private payment application uh, requires about a million gates and uh, this, is, this is great. Uh, it's actually very practical, and this is why you see things like Zcash in deployment today. Now, um, if we look at a typical smart contract execution, and we try to map it into the circuit world, we find that uh, the actual cost of these things is around 100 million gates. And for a larger smart contract execution, we find ourselves using billions of gates. So unfortunately, current monolithic ZK SNARK implementations uh, run out of memory at around 10 million gates. And this makes this particular application, uh, smart contract executions, just out of reach from current techniques. So we, so we asked ourselves, you know, what could be a stepping stone for enabling uh, applications such as this? And uh, this is where you know, I present here DISIC. Um, DISIC is a zero-knowledge uh, proof system that is, one, distributed, meaning it enables the execution of a ZK SNARK setup and prover across a compute cluster. Second, it is scalable, so it reaches heretofore unreachable circuit sizes, uh, up to billions of gates. Um, and the intuition that we have and the pattern that we see is that as we double the number of machines, uh, we effectively support twice the circuit size. The third point is uh, that this is a uh, parallel. So it speeds up the time it takes to generate a proof. And again, the pattern that we see is that as we double the number of machines, we, uh, the general computation itself is roughly twice as fast. So how did we do it? Well, the approach that we took was um, to take a monolithic ZK SNARK, uh, namely one by Jens Groth from 2016, and uh, distributed it on a cluster of machines. Now this approach seems quite simple. Um, however, it turns out there were a lot of challenges uh, to distributing the protocol. Um, we chose Grot16 specifically because it is highly efficient and currently offers the smallest uh, ZK SNARK proof size. And in general, we had to tailor our architecture uh, at every level 
to ensure that our protocol could adequately demonstrate scalability and parallelism. So let's talk about, uh, and, and let's, let me walk you through some of these challenges uh, that we face now. So in terms of challenges, like let's take this uh, ZK SNARK diagram, and um, I wanna point out that the verifier in this context is extremely small and really cheap to run. Uh, therefore, we turn our attention to the setup and the prover. At first glance, uh, we, we'd probably want to spin up a cluster of machines and uh, run the setup and prover on it. Uh, and next, we'd probably want to use a distributed data structure uh, to represent our public function F, the proving key, and uh, our secret input. This looks all right, uh, however it's not. And uh, there's several challenges uh, that arise with this current setup. The first is that we're multiplying polynomials of degree that are in the billions. Second, we're representing these polynomials as terabit sized arrays. Third, we're accessing large pools of shared memory in complex patterns. And uh, fourth, we're synchronizing shared state that incurs significant network delays. All in all, these fundamental challenges are things that we need to overcome, and uh, we do so in the following way. So um, we start with the setup. And it turns out it's not enough to keep the subcomponents of the setup itself monolithic. And so we distribute uh, the setup by implementing distributed algorithms uh, for the subcomponents of the setup. The distributed setup then outputs uh, a proving key, a distributed proving key, and a small verification key. Just as before, we distribute the prover by distributing the monolithic subcomponents of the prover. And lastly, we will verify that the proof is valid. Um, and again, uh, we forego distributing this step as it's extremely cheap to run. So for time's sake, I want to focus on one critical part of our system, and uh, that's the distributed prover. You will find details of all of, this, uh, all of these distributed techniques in the paper for DISIC. Um, it's available online, and I'll uh, show you the link at the end. Um, but today I really want to go over one critical component in this system, and that's namely the witness reduction. So the witness reduction, uh, I will show you some of uh, the off-the-shelf approaches that you can use to compute this reduction, um, and then I will show you the tailored approach that we use uh, to make this witness reduction both scalable and parallel. So uh, to efficiently compute the ZK-SNARK proof, we need to, the circuit, uh, we started with in a uh, polynomial form, and namely the equation that we want to evaluate here is this one. Oops. Um, if you haven't seen this equation before, uh, this is an important equation introduced in GGPR 13 uh, that defines a quadratic arithmetic program which has to do with arithmetization for circuits. And if we zoom in on this equation, there are three terms that need to be efficiently represented um, and evaluated in order to perform the witness reduction. Uh, also notice that these terms uh, have summations from zero to n, where n is in the billions. So I'll focus on how we efficiently evaluate these summations. Um, note that the arithmetic operations outside of these three terms uh, will make use of distributed FFTs, uh, which again, you can find it in the paper. Um, and zooming in on one of these terms, uh, we see that there are two components, uh, a matrix A and a vector Z. The matrix A uh, represents one part of the input wires comprising our circuit, and the vector Z is a satisfying assignment uh, for the circuit. Um, you, you can think of it kind of like a combination of the public inputs and the private inputs that we discussed earlier. So, as a straw man for computing this, um, we might start by representing our matrix A as follows and representing uh, our vector Z as follows. We'll represent uh, these as uh, matrices and vectors in their canonical form and to evaluate the summation, uh, we need to join the elements by their index I. So as a straw man approach, we may partition our matrix A row wise and our vector Z element wise. Next, we'll join our partitions row-wise. Um, so A0 with Z0, A1 with Z1, dot, 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 uh, down to AN with ZN. And this generates a join table that will look like this. It appears quite uniform in cost, uh, with each entry now independent of all of the other entries. Uh, but it turns out that 
this isn't the case. And let's see why. So here's an example of the data that, that would be stored in this case. And um, because of the nature of our circuit representation, um, our matrix is what we call almost sparse. And this means that uh, most rows and columns are sparse. However, there will always be a handful that are dense. So in this case, think of the red, uh, red entries as like your dense entries and the green ones as your sparse entries. Um, if we partitioned our matrix column-wise to compute, uh, for, for the cluster to compute, um, the second column would be slow and straggle, uh, causing all the other machines to wait on it to finish its task. This is obviously a bad thing, um, and so this is probably not the best way to look at it. Um, if we tried the other approach of uh, partitioning this matrix row-wise, well, again, we'll actually run into the same problem uh, with the first row as our straggler and causing all of the other machines to wait on it to finish its task. We studied uh, all of the um, off-the-shelf approaches to address this problem currently, and uh, this is mainly trying to address a problem of data skew, and we benchmarked them uh, across uh, varying circuit sizes and also across varying numbers of machines to, def uh, to determine their feasibility. And uh, the approach that we took with these was to basically say, let's replicate and partition the data so that the computation is distributed evenly. This is what all of the uh, off-the-shelf approaches try to do from a, it's like a systems level approach. So the first one that we looked at was block join. And block join is one of the common techniques to address data skew. Um, what it does is it will replicate each entry in uh, one distributed data set across every machine. So the hope is that when you're joined with the other distributed data set, the partitions will m uh, be more or less uh, evenly spread across the machines. And what we end up with is a join table that looks like this. So at first glance, this table looks quite large, and indeed it is. Uh, block join has performed uh, uh, n plus one times the number of partition replications. And recall that n plus one here is, again, in the billions. And so now every partition here is dense, and therefore the computation is uniform. Well, <laughs> that's true. Uh, however, uh, the table is also now huge and, and impractical to compute. So this does not work for our system. And so we turned to other off-the-shelf approaches. Next, we benchmarked another common technique uh, to address data skew that's called skew join. And skew join takes a more fine-grained approach by first computing uh, usage statistics, and it will replicate frequently used entries for every machine. This sounds more reasonable, and indeed, in most cases, it really is. Um, however, for our system, it turns out this provides us with minimal advantage, and uh, let's see why. So uh, if our matrix A is partitioned row-wise and we perform a skew join operation with vector Z, we see that each partition only needs to access one unique element uh, from the vector Z. And in this case, uh, skew join is actually functionally equivalent to the Strawman approach we saw earlier. Now, if our matrix A is partitioned column-wise and we perform a skew join with vector Z, we see that each partition now needs access uh, to every unique element from the vector Z. In this case, um, we actually find that skew join uh, then is basically equivalent uh, to block join, um, and that was an approach that we saw earlier that we had deemed to be one that's dense and therefore impractical for our use cases. So no matter how we organize the data here, uh, off-the-shelf approaches will cause unnecessary replications uh, that blow up our memory cost requirements, and it makes it impossible to scale the system. Um, actually, in, in fact, I think uh, the, the approach, this approach that we used at the time, uh, it turns out it wouldn't even scale beyond like 50 million constraints uh, on 128 machines. And so uh, until then, you know, this is really a, a twice, it, it's, it actually turned out to be twice as slow as our tailored approach, and I'm going to describe that next. So for the tailored approach, um, we implemented one that basically can evaluate our witness reduction and preserve uh, scalability and parallelism. Um, the approach that we took was to isolate and transform the data so that the computation is distributed evenly. And let me show you a high-level picture of how we do this. So we start with the uh, almost sparse matrix A from before, 
and we perform now a pre-processing step. This will get us our density counts, and so uh, this will get us density counts for each of the partitions that are in this matrix, and these statistics will inform our system how to isolate the dense vectors from the sparse vectors, which we do next. So using this density count information, our system will then split dense vectors uh, into sparse partitions. Now to perform the join operation between matrix A and vector Z, um, we will perform what we call a hybrid join. A hybrid join will replicate only a handful of the unique elements from vector Z, as we uh, said our matrix A here is almost sparse. And um, notice now that in our case, uh, each partition actually just has one dense computation to perform. So our replication factor was minimal, and uh, as our approach is able to preserve the uh, almost sparse structural representation of matrix A, we find that this actually ends up being uh, quite well. This enables us to uh, join our data and compute the summations from before without uh, stragglers. And uh, in practice, for the same number of machines, we find that uh, our tailored approach now enables us to reach billions of gates, uh, where off-the-shelf approaches, we had said, kept us uh, away from like, being uh, in the billions of gates. And, um, and so along with other distributed subcomponents that were described in this paper, we're able to architect a zero-knowledge proof system that is actually scalable and parallel. So we implemented DISIC, um, and we used a cluster compute framework called Apache Spark. Our system is written in Java uh, with approximately 10,000 lines of code. And uh, we ran our experiments on EC2 um, using our 3 8 x large instances. These each have 32 virtual CPUs and 244 gigabytes of memory. Uh, our evaluations showed us some really interesting patterns and uh, properties. So in terms of the largest supported circuit size, um, well, we first uh, evaluated this and uh, against LibSnark. Uh, LibSnark is a C++ library for ZK snarks, um, and uh, we profiled this in our environment uh, and found that it would reach approximately 4 million gates. Um, when we profiled DISIC across a different number of machines, we found that we were able to reach approximately 2 billion gates with 256 machines. And the pattern that we saw here is that as we double the number of machines, uh, we were able to support twice the circuit size. So this then led us to ask, you know, could we compute uh, up to these large circuit sizes in a time efficient manner? It's one thing to just be able to reach that, it's another to be able to reach that in a practical manner. And um, that's where we look at scalability. So here we have two graphs, uh, on the left is the setup and on the right is the prover. Note that this is a log-log scale graph and so um, if we follow the uh, trend on one of these lines, namely the one for 256 machines, we find that the slope is approximately equal to one. So this is uh, linear, uh, approximately linear. And uh, the pattern that we see is that as we double the circuit size, we're able to support twice the, uh, or we're able to compute, uh, it takes roughly twice the time to compute. And that's a very nice property to have. Here again, we plot the same data now, uh, but show the number of machines on the x-axis and plot the circuit size. So this is uh, trying to demonstrate parallelism. And again, on the left, we have the setup, and on the right, we have the prover. Um, if we follow this line at two to the 26, this green line, um, the pattern that we see here is that as we double the number of machines, uh, this computation is actually approximately twice as fast. Again, this is a terrific property of the system and something that we find very, uh, that would be very necessary for computing large instances. And so in conclusion, um, we found that, our, uh, that prior ZK snarks support maximum circuit sizes uh, in the millions of gates at an amortized cost per gate of one millisecond. And we find with our techniques that DISIC is able to support maximum circuit sizes uh, in the billions of gates uh, at an amortized cost per gate of approximately 10 microseconds. Um, the full paper is available on crypto ePrint and uh, I'm also proud to say that we've released DISIC um, as an open source library on GitHub. Uh, you can find it by going to DISIC.org. And uh, we've put a lot of hard work into making this library available to the public with a, a convenient profiling infrastructure so that you can replicate these results. But uh, you can also use it to build new and uh, interesting applications with DISIC. And uh, lastly, I'd like to leave you with uh, two open questions. So, the first question is with regards to even larger circuits. What techniques will get us to trillions of gates, if any? And uh, 
based on napkin math, if you look at uh, the current uh, techniques that we use, we need approximately 100,000 machines in the best case scenario, which frankly is too many. Um, the second open question is uh, with regards to other succinct zero knowledge proofs. So how efficiently can other succinct zero knowledge proofs be distributed? And um, you can look at you know, Starks or Bulletproofs. Um, our techniques are likely an excellent starting point. They share a lot of common uh, primitives below and uh, it seems to be an area that would be very fruitful to, to study further. And so um, with that, I'd like to conclude and thanks for your attention. So here's some questions. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, what is the input for DISIC? So if I wanted to use that, what would I have to um, yeah, pass into it to compile? Or, yeah. yeah, so to use the system, um, you basically need to have like a problem, like some function that you're trying to compute, and then uh, you have to map that into a circuit world. Um, once you have that, you'll have like your public inputs and your private inputs that you need to provide. Um, all of this would then run on you know, either your personal machine or on a cluster machine where you could, uh, it, it can really be, be operated on any system that supports the Java, like JVM in this case. And um, in general, like, as long as you have all the dependencies that the library requires you to do, then that's kind of all the, the pieces that you need. Um, so it's this R1 CS constraint system, basically, that's the input to the DZIC? Yeah, so the current library uh, supports like a rank one constraint systems, and uh, we use that and map it to like quadratic, or reduce it to quadratic arithmetic programs. Um, if you'd like to try other approaches, you're also welcome to contribute on that front, uh, but right now that's the MP language that we support. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, looking at the performance graphs, um, after, after a certain amount of uh, executors, it looks like the system reaches some kind of uh, diminishing returns. So after, I see that for smaller instances, and after 128, and you go to 256 in the, yeah, in this. Oops. Um, one second. Yeah. Emissions are slow. They should have like a scroll feature. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the next graph, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here. Uh, I noticed that the setup and the provers in the in the lower part of the graphs they start taking longer. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason to that? Is it that similar to other parallel? Uh, um, how after a while adding more CPUs does not make the parallelism better and just computational overhead? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. Um, I'm going to move it to this previous graph and just kind of show you on the, the red curve here. Um, it's the same It's the same property that you're pointing out there. The, the trade-off that's being made is that as you grow the number of machines, you basically start to have this setup cost overhead. Um, and, and not to be confused with the distributed setup, it's like the actual uh, cost of like uh, you know, turning on and, and spinning up all of these machines. Um, there is a, a cost of coordinating all of them, getting them on the same page to solve a problem in this case, uh, to generate a proof. And uh, that cost itself will grow as you increase the number of machines. Uh, on this graph, we only plotted from two to the 15 onwards, but in practice, because uh, I, I tried it from like two to the five and through two to the 10, you actually see that it starts to really, really cross over thresholds so that to the point that like this will be actually the highest and this will be the lowest. And that's a natural trade-off that you're making because as you increase the number of machines, the communication costs on network and also memory resources has to be shared and all those things grow. Like, and so the, the real value in this is actually kind of when you start to cross over that threshold and you're looking at large problems that it becomes useful to do a distributed technique. Thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the, although this reduces the cost of calculating a proof from a circuit, um, is is it still prohibitively expensive to calculate the circuit from a virtual machine, bytecode, or whatever representation that you'd have that would be executable normally? Um, so are you saying like uh, 
if I were to have some problem that I map into a circuit and then I want to compute this, like that process before I get to computing would still be hard? Is that the question? Or? Uh, I, I mean, like calculating the circuit diagram from some form that a human would write. Oh, um, well, so the, the actual c computations here are, are happening in the cluster, so it would be solved uh, through the system. I'm not sure Maybe I'm not my, understanding. I'm not sure I'm phrasing my, my, uh, my question correctly. Um, so like, uh, if, you, if you, for example, you want to prove some kind of smart contract, mm -hmm. um, is it still prohibitively expensive to use in a real blockchain to have like a human readable language of some kind to compute the circuit diagram from that language or from a bytecode? Is that step still very expensive? Because this, um, this system starts with the circuit diagram. Yeah, so th this this system itself assumes that you, you come to it with like a circuit, right? And the steps uh, leading up to that um, are not being addressed in the system currently. Um, to make that practical, I would say it it's really not too bad of a problem right now. Um, certainly you have optimizations that would uh, be helpful to basically reduce the circuit size, but from my understanding, and I don't know if Thibaut's here and wants to clarify, but um, there, there is basically um, some cost to, to constructing those circuits. It's actually a lot less than the uh, arithmetic of the circuits themselves. And so uh, in practice, you can do that on a single machine and load it up onto this cluster just fine. It's, it may be you know, an hour or something, I, I don't know. But um, in practice, like, this still remains the bulk of the computations, which uh, it would not be restricted to. It, it's bottlenecks on. That's a great answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Cool. Uh, so these graphs are useful to come calculate uh, like times, uh, like if I have so many machines uh, and so many circuit sites, uh, it will take me so much. Uh, is there, can, can you refer a um, like quota reference where I can actually compare some actual use cases and uh, try to figure out how many, like what, what's the circuit size? For example, like, cal calculate the Ethereum transactions at like so many million gas. Like how, how, how much circuit size would I need to, com to, to construct such a ZK proof? Yeah, so we, we didn't evaluate it for like the smart contract case, but we did two applications that you can find in the paper. One was uh, actually implementing another previous paper called PhotoProof. And what that's doing is think of like, uh, like Photoshop operations, like image transformations. And each of these image transformations is a state transition. And so if you could have like a proof uh, that the state transition uh, is valid and, and it only does, you know, blah things and it comes from a logical, like a, 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 a properly signed like a camera, for example, then you can maintain the certificates uh, that, that ensure the integrity of the image. Um, so that was one that we did, and we actually were able to get it up to like, um, I think it was like five or seven megapixel uh, uh, photos that on just uh, on just like 32 or 64 machines, and it would it would take like a minute or two. It was like pretty quick, if I remember correctly. So you could use uh, you could use that as like a, a heuristic benchmark for like if I had a smart contract and I'm trying to apply some matrix operation. You know, it's a very similar type of context that you could potentially try to map the the, the, the napkin math the cost to. Um, the second application that we did was. Uh, really like machine learning use cases. So there's a lot of uh, demand for, or interest really, for um, having like verifiably like integratable um, uh, machine learning computations. Uh, like uh, a lot of that is just linear algebra really underneath. And so as long as we can represent this in this matrix form, which we actually show it is, um, then you can compute a lot of uh, machine learning uh, techniques like linear regression and whatnot um, very naturally in this system. And uh, we also highlight that in the paper as something that's uh, in the realm of practical for small problems. Any more questions? Oh, one all the way in the back. Hey. Hey. Um can you use that approach to do uh, delegation of proofs to a third party? And are there any ways to still guarantee privacy of the private inputs? That's a really good question. And uh, so that, that's one of the fundamental uh, trade-offs that are being made here. Like uh, this is a distributed system, not necessarily a decentralized system. And um, in, inherently, uh, if you spin up a cluster, the trust model is that I assume that I trust all of these machines to be in my control and to behave honestly with me. So, you know, if I go on AWS and I spin up a cluster of EC2 instances, then I'm assuming here that 
I own all of those EC2 instances and I'm not tampering that hardware in this case. Um, it, it's, it's another model to say like, hey, like maybe there's an, some other party that is doing this. Uh, they're spinning up an EC2 instance and I give them my data, in which case like you would need to have like another layer, another additional layer of protocols which you know, weren't explored here. But I would, I would think like you could do some type of encryption approaches or homomorphic encryption approaches that while extremely costly uh, may get you something okay for you know, reasonably sized problems. But that's an area that's certainly open for, for more exploration. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I don't know if you can tell, but lunch is actually, I think it's been served. So uh, thank you so much, Howard. Yeah, thank you. And you guys, uh, we'll be back here, I think, at 2. I think that's when the, it comes back. We're going to review the afternoon and talk about what's coming up.